Thank you all for coming to this panel. I think it'll be great. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, Director of Practice Groups. I'm also in charge of cleaning up the dishes after this event, so <laughs> uh, please, please be uh, kind. Um, Normally, we would have uh, Lee O'Connor, who's chairman of our administrative law practice group, introduce this panel and our moderator, but she's not able to join us today, so I am substituting for her. Uh, make a brief announcement about the practice groups. They are the entities within the Federalist Society that plan the National Lawyers Convention, uh, and each one of the practice groups puts on a special breakout session, and this is the administrative law practice group session. Uh, so I wanted to be clear about that and let you know that each one of those practice groups is uh, led by an executive committee, a volunteer committee of our best and brightest leaders. Uh, we've lost a few of those people in the recent, you know, past 24 months or so. Um, they seem to be cycling into government. Um, so we're actively recruiting new members uh, in leadership. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can find, um, well, email Lee O'Connor or find me, email me, and we'd be happy to discuss the possibilities. So now uh, it's my honor to introduce Judge Greg Katzis. Uh, he is our moderator today. Uh, I think he's known to many of you, so I will be brief. He was a law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas, both at the District Court, uh, District DC Circuit Court, and uh, during uh, Clarence Thomas's first uh, term on the Supreme Court. And he has this habit now of following Justice Thomas. So he's gone to the DC Circuit himself, and who knows where from there. Uh, from 2001 to 2009, he was at the Department of Justice as an Assistant Attorney General in the, in the Civil Division and Acting Assistant, uh, Acting Associate Attorney General. Uh, and there he supervised most of the federal government's appellate litigation. Uh, he's been at, uh, a, a partner at Jones Day as well, and most recently before his uh, nomination and confirmation to his current job, uh, he was a Deputy White House Counsel uh, doing good work there. So. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Judge Greg Katzis. Thank you, Dean. Uh, it's great to be here. I know no one ever comes to events like this to listen to the moderator, so I will just introduce our very distinguished panel and then we'll get going. Uh, Christopher Walker uh, is an associate professor of law at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Before joining the faculty, he clerked uh, for Judge Alex Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit uh, and for Justice Anthony Kennedy on the US Supreme Court. Um, he also worked on the appellate staff of the Civil Division at the Justice Department, a group for which I have particularly fond um, affection. Um, his publications um, have appeared in the Michigan Minnesota, Stanford, and University of Pennsylvania Law Reviews, among others. He serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States and on the Governing Council of the ABA's Section on Administrative Law and Regulatory Practice. Professor Jack Bierman uh, is the Henry Elwood Warren Scholar and Professor of Law at the Boston University Law School. His scholarship focuses on civil rights litigation and administrative law. Professor Bierman has authored or co-authored four books on administrative law, including a widely used casebook. He's written extensively on judicial deference to agency legal determinations, on the problem of midnight rulemaking, and on legal aspects of the funding crisis facing public sector unions. His articles have appeared in the in the BU, Duke, Stanford, and UCLA law reviews, among others. He clerked for Judge Richard Cudahy on the Seventh Circuit, and he too serves as a public member of ACUS. Uh, Allison Ho is a partner in the Dallas office of Gibson Dunn, uh, where she heads the firm's appellate and constitutional law practice group in Texas. She's widely regarded as one of the nation's top appellate litigators. She's presented over 50 appellate arguments, including ones in the Supreme Court uh, and every federal court of appeals. Um, she's previously served as a special assistant to President George W. Bush, a counselor to Attorney General John Ashcroft, and a law clerk to Judge Jacques Wiener on the Fifth Circuit and Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court. 
She's a member of the American Law Institute and on the Legal Policy Advisory Board of the Washington Legal Foundation. Uh, Stephen Baden uh, is Principal Deputy General Counsel for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He previously practiced law at the, the great firm of Jones Day, uh, where he litigated, uh, represented clients during government investigations, and counseled clients on a wide range of political law issues. He clerked for Judge Samuel Mays of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Tennessee and Judge Julia Gibbons on the Sixth Circuit. Um, our panel will begin with eight-minute presentations, and I will strive to enforce the red light uh, more vigorously than we do in the D.C. Circuit. <laughs> All right, we're standing up. Uh, it's so great to be here and to talk about agency adjudication. Um, and I want to kind of take a step back and, and, and kind of frame this more as the federal judiciary more broadly to kind of give you a sense of where most judging happens these days. And I looked it up and apparently we have 748 active federal Article III judges in the United States today. Uh, and this is kind of one way to kind of get a sense of the volume or at least the aspect of that. By contrast, we have um, almost 2,000 administrative law judges in the United States. Uh, of those, I don't want to kind of make this seem too, most of those are, are at the Social Security Administration, so they're doing something a little bit different than, than, than the, judge, the administrative law judges at the SEC are doing. Uh, and that's kind of the old world of agency adjudication. Uh, the things that if you took administrative law in law school, you learned about the Administrative Procedure Act, administrative law judges. Uh, and that's kind of hopefully what you're thinking about when you hear agency adjudication. There's a new world of agency adjudication as well. It's not actually that new, but it's new to a lot of us as scholars that are exploring it. Uh, these are agency adjudicators that are not administrative law judges, but still hold evidentiary hearings by statute, as required by statute or regulation. And to give you a sense of that, Kent Barnett and the Administrative Conference did a survey this last year. And of the agencies surveyed, they found over 10,000 agency adjudicators uh, that aren't ALJs at these agencies. So in other words, if you're kind of comparing the federal judiciary today, the Article III judiciary, we're talking about 750 judges. The administrative judiciary, we're talking about well over 13,000. And if I want to complicate things even more, when I kind of gave this pitch at the ABA uh, Administrative Law Conference last week or two weeks ago, a number of law professors and agency officials came up and said, well, there's this whole nother layer of agency adjudicators. Uh, the, the folks at the IRS, the folks at the border that are deciding whether so someone comes in or not. Uh, and I kind of conservatively then put that number at 50,000. Uh, and they were like, it's in the hundreds of thousands of agency adjudicators that are judging claims and the like there. So when we talk about the judiciary in the United States today, I really hope that we'll spend more time than we're gonna do in this panel talking about the administrative judiciary and its role in our constitutional structure. Uh, and this last year at the Supreme Court, we had a chance to really explore a, a lot of the constitutional tensions in agency adjudication in these contexts through kind of two cases that came before the court. I want to spend just a little bit of time on that, and then I'll sit down and let other people um, jump in with kind of more, more profound comments. Uh, but I think through these two cases you see, especially seeing them through the eyes of Justice Gorsuch, who wrote a concurrence in one of the, or joined a concurrence in one of the cases and wrote a dissent in the other, you really see these, these, this tension in agency adjudication between there needs to be political control of these administrative judges and there's a lot of danger in having political control over administrative judges. So the first case is one I, hopefully you're all pretty familiar with, which is the Lucia versus SEC case. In that case, the question is whether administrative law judges at the Securities and Exchange Commission, of which there are, I think, only a half dozen, whether they are officers of the United States or not. And the Supreme Court said that they're at least inferior officers of the United States, and hence they have to be appointed by a head of the department, the president or Congress under the Constitution. Um, and Justice Kagan, when I saw that she was right in the majority opinion, I knew it was going to be a really narrow opinion that did basically just applied Supreme Court precedent, saying these tax, judge, tax judges are inferior officers, so... So are the patent administrative judges that were under review there. 
uh, sorry, so the SEC administrative law judges were under review in, in that case. Uh, but what I found most interesting was the concurrence by Justice Thomas, uh, which was joined by Justice Gorsuch. And in this concurrence, uh, Justice Thomas fully embraced uh, the terrific work that's been di done by Professor Jen Mascott, looking at the original understanding of the term officer in the Constitution and said that this includes administrative law judges and includes a lot of other types of officers that hold, exercise a continuing duty under statute. Um, and, and so what I liked about it though, there's one quote uh, from that that I just kind of want to highlight. Uh, and this is Justice Thomas joined by Justice Gorsuch says, the appointments clause maintains clear lines of accountability, encouraging good appointments and giving the public someone to blame for bad ones. In other words, in Lucia for Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas, it was critical uh, that these judges were politically controlled that ultimately the commission would have the final call on the ultimate outcome of the case. All right, let's switch over to oil states uh, versus green energy group. This is the constitutional challenge uh, to the patent trial and appeal board. And I can go long and long on this. I have an article coming out with Melissa Wasserman in the California Law Review about this. I'm not gonna go on and on. It's a fascinating new type of agency adjudication where you can basically relitigate the issuance of a patent at the agency level instead of having to go to district court. In that case, the question presented was whether those rights are public or private. If they're public, they can be adjudicated under Supreme Court precedent by an agency. If they're private, they need to be adjudicated in Article III court with the jury. Um, the Supreme Court, Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion, says the public under the precedent, under the original understanding for that matter as well. Uh, and so we don't have a problem. Justice Gorsuch joined by Chief Justice Roberts in the dissent. Uh, it's a fascinating read. It's actually probably my favorite opinion of the term, just the structure and the style of it. Uh, first, of course, makes the argument that these are actually private rights, at least for Article III purposes, and so they need to be adjudicated uh, by an Article III tribunal. Uh, and then they go through and explain the dangers of political control. And I just want to kind of think of the quote I had before and juxtapose it with this from Justice Gorsuch. Powerful interests are capable of amassing armies of lobbyists and lawyers to influence or even capture politically accountable bureaucracies. In other words, the problem with agency adjudication, at least with private rights or with things that may be quasi-private rights, is that it, the political control. Uh, so you have these tensions that we're going to see continue to be worked out at the Supreme Court. And we're going to see them because Lucia didn't answer the question of removal. And that question is going to come back to the court probably in the very near future. And this debate between political control that they think we have to have under the appointments clause uh, and the dangers of political control, the reasons why we have an Article III court that is judiciary that is insulated from political control, and those are really the dangers. Do I have, oh, I have one minute. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do just really quickly. So what are the solutions? One solution last year that Stephen Calabresi made at this conf convention was to just get rid of article, or non-Article III adjudicators that adjudicate private rights or issue you know, penalties and like. He calculates that at being like 160 administrative law judges that he would just convert into uh, spaces on the federal judiciary. That kind of broke Twitter. <laughs> I'm not really sure. It was a court packing plan. It wasn't too well received by those on the left and the right because it seemed like a little bit of a too cute move. But that would definitely solve it, right? The problem of adjudication of private rights by agencies. The second one, which I might spend more time in the Q&A thinking about, uh, the exception that we have in Kroll v. Benson that the Chief Justice Roberts rearticulated in Stern v. Marshall was if you're a true adjunct, if the agency adjudicator is really just a true adjunct of an Article III court, uh, then it's okay. What would a true adjunct look like? Uh, it's complicated. In fact, there's not a lot of guidance on that. But it seems like they have to make very narrow factual determinations and that the district court has to enter the order. So I would suggest that that would be at least getting rid of Chevron deference in the adjudication context. And it might be at most also getting rid of anything that looks like a rulemaking power in adjudication. So to channel Dom again from last year's conf convention, it might be requiring to get rid of Chenery. Uh, and, and the idea that an agency can make policy, especially retroactive policy, through an adjudication. So again, this is just dealing with more qua private or quasi-private right adjudication, not your social security side. Uh, but there's still a vast amount that's done in that context by federal agencies instead of Article III courts. 
you, know, you, you can applaud for Chris. It won't take any of my time, I promise. So, good job. But, um, I want to I want to say that um, I'm going to focus on what I thought was a more direct question of this panel, which is the appropriateness of uh, making policy through adjudications as opposed to rules. And I just want to say that I want to I have a paper coming out in the George Mason Law Review on the Article Three questions. And one thing that um, I just want to say one thing, which is that if you actually thought you could get accountability by having the secretaries of cabinet. Uh, cabinet departments appointing the administrative law judges, that's all they would be doing if they actually were going to read even one paragraph on each of them that they would have to appoint. So there's a, that's, there's a little bit of an issue of whether that idea needs to be at least updated somewhat in the way our Constitution works. But I want to, um, uh, I want to say that in terms of the um, idea of whether policy ought to, by agencies ought to be made through rulemaking and adjudication, I think the Chenery Court got it exactly right, which is it's a normative question for the, both Congress and the agency to decide, and there's pros and cons in different situations, and uh, I think that there are some times when they ought to do it one way and sometimes when they ought to do it the other way, and other times when maybe either way is fine. Um, but I think that really what's underlying the, tone, the sort of proposal of this panel is that policy making shouldn't be happening by agencies at all. And so, I don't really understand this, why this is an issue unless this is just another in the shotgun blast against the administrative state. Um, the same people who question policy making by adjudication probably also don't like policy making by rulemaking. And I think they raise all kinds of <laughs> frivolous, I think they raise all kinds of frivolous non-delegation doctrine and other separation of powers issues. And I think it just illustrates that the people that are, that want to dismantle the administrative state, they want some other constitution. They don't want the constitution of the United States. They want some other constitution. And so as a matter of separation of powers, I suppose the argument is that when an agency adjudicates, it's usurping the judicial power as assigned by Article III, in the federal, to, uh, assigned by Article III to the federal courts. And this just isn't consistent with the way the US constitution has ever been understood by the Supreme Court. As understood by the Supreme Court, the Constitution creates a flexible government with divided and blended powers, and Justice Thomas in the patent case was exactly right. When an agency uses an adjudicative procedure, it's executing the law. When an agency does a rulemaking, it's executing the law. The agencies cannot exercise any of the judicial power, and they can't exercise any of the legislative power. When they do these things, they're, 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 <laughs> they're executing the law. That's the U.S. Constitution. Maybe there's some other constitution that would have a stricter or different separation of powers, but that's not the one we have. Uh, now, historically, policy making through adjudication is, has always been considered the most legitimate method of policy making by uh, agencies. It's got a much longer pedigree than legislative rulemaking. It goes back to the state and fe early federal rate making agencies which even Professor Epstein seemed to think was okay for, for agencies to, uh, to deal with. Um, I say that with all affection. I had him for several courses in law school, and it always makes me feel good when I hear him on a piano. <laughs> Nothing worked, but um, like the Interstate Commerce Commission. And the results of adjudication are perfectly legitimate because they're part of the executive process, and they're subject to judicial review, just like um, rules created by rulemaking. Now, policy making by adjudication has some advantages that I think even people who are concerned about the administrative state ought to, ought to recognize. Um, and that's why Congress has adopted it in so many situations. It allows for policy making in the context of a specific dispute with an adversarial process for arguing the issues in light of a particular, fa particular factual economic circumstances. It resonates with the way that the original regulatory agencies proceeded, and it was viewed as a more legitimate pr its process than, than agencies setting agencies loose to make broad abstract pronouncements of rules in a legislative-like process. It's more confined. An actual case has to come before the agency agency, although they can pick what case by enforcing, if they can't just go out and sort of set their own agenda and make a rule, which is actually why the, the current rulemaking at the NLRB to, to deal with the joint employer issue is controversial, because it's the NLRB stepping out of its usual role, which is to uh, uh, only make policy in the course of, a, of, a, uh, of an actual enforcement action. And they make these policies through adjudication, with m most of them are multi-member agencies, and it's bipartisan, so you have debate and you have broad consideration. On the law, the Supreme Court in the Wyman-Gordon case, eight to one, the justices agreed that policy making by adjudication was fine under both, uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act and under the Constitution. Only Justice Douglas disagreed. <laughs> 
Uh, the other, there was a little bit of disagreement about the prospectivity issue. And what's interesting is one of the attacks on adjudication policymaking is that it's retroactive, but actually when it's prospective, it looks fishy because it looks like they're avoiding the rulemaking procedures by dressing up what's actually a rulemaking procedure in the, procedure in the guise of an adjudication. Now, I know that one of the big advantages to rulemaking is public participation. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's as signif that advantage is as significant as it was before. We have now, everything's on the internet, we have the 24-hour news cycle. Within an hour of a major issue coming before an agency in adjudicatory proceeding, Fox News can have a fake story about it out. I, I, oh, that was the wrong audience. Uh, CNN can have a fake, or MSNBC can have a fake news story about it. Um, you know, so, um, uh, you know, the, the, now there's a special case about cabinet level agencies with appeal to the secretary, and that still exists at the Department of Agriculture. Cor am I correct about that? With the judicial officer hearing those cases? And I, you know, I actually think that the secretaries of various departments can really efficiently use adjudication to state agency policy and set it up for judicial review. Recently, um, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions took some immigration cases for himself because he wanted to state clearly the um, Department of Justice's position on certain issues about, about immigration law. Now, I don't disagree with, I don't agree with his particulars that the fear of gang violence and sexual violence is not a ground for, um, uh, for uh, ought not be a ground for asylum, but I think it's an efficient and appropriate way for him to articulate the Justice Department's policy and he can tee it up for a re relatively quick and definitive answer on judicial review. So where Congress has, uh, and the other thing is that uh, rulemaking can also play a role in adjudication and it's somewhat controversial. Congress sometimes creates adjudicatory agencies and then they they allow the agency also to have rulemaking power, and agencies use that rulemaking power to narrow the issues that are going to be decided in the adjudicatory proceeding. And that's actually controversial because the people, like this happened with the Federal Communications Commission, it happened with the National Labor Relations um, uh, uh, Agency, uh, it happened with uh, other agencies. Um, which ones are, it's escaping me at this moment, but there's an argument that this deprives people of their full hearing that, on all issues that they're supposed to have in the adjudicatory process. And I, they have a good point, uh, but the courts have approved it, sometimes on the condition that the agency allow for the, the subjects of these enforcement actions to argue that the particular rule that was made shouldn't apply to them. And I think that's a good compromise on sort of forfeiting your full hearing rights. Um, the, the, there's a special case of agencies that are supposed to be primarily or almost only adjudicatory agencies. So we all know the a NLRB has only made two rules in its history. It's working on its third. One of those rules was a rule requiring employers to post rights under the NLRA. Um, and th that rule came before two courts of appeals and both held that it was unlawful because the NLRB doesn't have regulatory power to reach out and address issues that aren't relevant to its the adjudications that it's going to hear. It would never be considered an, a, a violation of the National Labor Relations Act not to put up that poster. Whereas the, the typical things that the NLRB hears are allegations that some conduct by a union or by management violates some principle of the National Labor Relations Act. I'm not sure what's going to happen with this current uh, rule that they're engaged in um, They uh, on the joint employer. I think they've got some problems with uh, uh, with the evidence that they're going to that they're going to present to to uh, justify that rule, it'll be subject to judicial review, and and um, uh, it's actually more controversial to do it by rulemaking than it would be by adjudication. So now my bottom line: of course, it's up to Congress to decide whether to create an agency with rulemaking as the primary form of policy policy making, or whether adjudication can also be that. In many ways, adjudication is less efficient more incremental and depends on cases arising that raise the issues that the agency wants to address. And this may be a good thing, especially if you're concerned with agencies overreaching by creating broad policies in rulemaking rule without clear statutory support. Um, thank you, Judge Katz. It's such a pleasure to be with everyone here today and be part of the discussion. Um, I would like to begin um, as the, the person who argued oil states in the Supreme Court by expressing my violent um, agreement uh, with Professor that Justice Gorsuch's dissent in that case is my favorite uh, <laughs> opinion from last term too. Um, no one should be the judge of his own cause. 
That principle pervades our legal tradition. Yet, it seems to apply everywhere except in the administrative state, which considers itself immune not only from constitutional requirements, but also fundamental legal principles like this one. Let me begin a little over a year ago when my team and I were preparing for oral argument in the oil states case before the Supreme Court. And the issue, as the professor has explained, before the court in that case um, concerned whether an administrative proceeding known as inter partes review, or IPR, uh, violated Article Three by allowing a dispute between two private parties to be adjudicated by a non-Article Three tribunal. So we were anticipating and preparing for questions about whether striking down IPR would put all administrative adjudication in the crosshairs, even though the configuration of IPR uh, was different. In IPR, as we've talked about, you have an agency resolving a dispute between two private parties, where in most administrative adjudications, you have the agency on one side of the V and a private party on the other side of the V. Um, my team, uh, shout out to Judd Stone and James Nelson on this, um, spent weeks searching through agency after agency for proceedings similar to IPRs. That is where the agency was resolving disputes between two private parties, as opposed to between a private party and on one side uh, and the agency on the other. And what we found was just a monumental labyrinth of agency proceedings that took weeks to disentangle and track down and even then, uh, my team eventually said that while they thought they had covered the waterfront as best they could, and they couldn't find any parallel to IPR, um, they couldn't be sure there wasn't uh, something out there in this labyrinth of adjudications that they missed. The administrative state was simply too large. Um, and indeed, when the opinion in oil states took uh, longer than we were uh, expecting, to come down, we used to joke uh, that the delay must be because uh, a law clerk or two must still be searching through the morass, looking for an analog to IPR to wave in our faces. Um, they must not have found one either. But perhaps that's because all of us were looking for a needle in a haystack. And until then, I really had not grasped the sheer size and scope of administrative adjudication until being confronted with the thing writ large, as it were. When we talk about Article III's guarantees that disputes will be adjudicated by judges with life tenure and salary protection, we're talking about structural protections designed to safeguard independence and impartiality. But when agencies engage in policy making by adjudication, the risk of arbitrariness and unfairness is at the very least apparent. And that should be troubling to all of us. If not as a matter of constitutional magnitude, then at least as one of good government. Um, take for example the IPR proceedings at issue in oil states. The agency decides how many judges will sit on an IPR panel which judges will sit on which panels, and can decide to seat the director himself on a panel. The agency also engages in a practice known as panel stacking, where after one panel of judges has rendered a decision, the director selects judges to add to an expanded panel in the same case with the express intent to ensure that the, that the director, and I, and I quote the agency's position on this, must be able to be, make sure that her policy judgments are enforced by the board in any given case. Now, if administrative adjudication is just another way for an agency to make policy, no different from rulemaking, then all is fine and well with the state of affairs. But I think there is something deeply troubling about this state of affairs. As agency policy making through adjudication raises serious separation of powers concerns rooted in the notion that there is something fundamentally distinct between policy making and between adjudicating in our constitutional system. Judges don't make policy from the bench and no one should be a judge in his own cause. 
This is precisely the danger that the founders sought to avoid by means of structural protections. Where you have schemes that allow the agency itself to initiate an action and prosecute the action and then decide the action, that is precisely the accumulation of power that the founders sought to, subject, to, to separate by structural means. As Justice Gorsuch has put the question in his oil state's dissent, can there be any doubt that this represents a retreat from the promise of judicial independence? And I want to close by focusing um, on the uh, uh, Lucia versus SEC opinion that professor that, that you, you touched on and look at it in, in a little different um, way. Again, the question there, that was an appointments clause case. Um, and so the question there was whether the SEC's ALJs um, are officers of the United States um, such that uh, they have to be appointed by the president or courts of law or heads of departments. Um, as a professor mentioned, Justice Kagan, writing for a 7-2 majority, rejected the agency's position. She began her opinion by outlining the extensive powers wielded by SEC ALJs in enforcement actions, powers comparable to those of a judge conducting a bench trial. The description of the extensive court-like powers wielded by the ALJs essentially decided the case. But the same reasons that ALJs can be said to exercise significant authority for appointments clause purposes are the same reasons that agency adjudications more broadly raise serious concerns for Article III purposes. In other words, the solution for the appointments clause purpose ensuring a check on the significant authority vested in SEC ALJs by requiring them to be appointed by politically accountable actors underscores the Article III problem of how to ensure the impartiality and independence of decision makers within and answerable to the executive branch. So to sum up, the, admin, the administrative adjudication implicates some of the most serious concerns about the administrative state concerns about separation of powers, as the agency is quite literally the judge of its own cause without the structural protections of independence and impartiality that are the hallmark of Article III courts. Given the vast extent of administrative adjudication, the significant authority wielded in these adjudications, and the serious consequences for citizens that flow from these adjudications, even if we disagree about whether they transgress constitutional limits, we should all agree they raise serious concerns worth meaningful consideration from a good government perspective. Well, what I want to what I want to talk about this afternoon is to uh, play off of the concerns raised by all three of the prior speakers, and also talk a little about the practicalities of what it is that agencies and departments of the federal government are, are seeking to do, uh, and some of the uh, that will take the form of a discussion about first principles that we've been hinting at, and then we're going to talk about some of the private sector interests and how things actually work. Uh, in the form of my suggestion to you of a process we use at the Department of Agriculture, uh, but has largely fallen into disuse in our other uh, fellow cabinet departments as a way to perhaps, uh, if not solve, help out some of the concerns that have been raised here today. Uh, first, we'll start off with first principles. Um, what we're all talking about here, what the concerns uh, that have been raised are around due process and whether or not regulated parties and citizens of the United States have appropriate notice and clarity of what the law requires of them uh, and what will happen to them if they run afoul of the law. Uh, and the debate that we have heard is between whether it is possible to have that as a part of a case-by-case -case adjudication process or perhaps whether we need to have some type of rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act be our preferred method uh, because without that notice and public comment and public interaction and the agency having to show its work in written form uh, before the law is enforced, uh, whether the, the uh, public who has to live under these laws is being uh, adequately suited, perhaps constitutionally, uh, but certainly as a matter of normative principles. Um, certainly in this administration, uh, 
uh, we favor notice and comment rulemaking, and we disfavor guidance uh, and other forms uh, that do not allow for public participation. But that is not necessarily to say that adjudication uh, is always bad uh, or should always be disfavored, although it's not necessarily the first option. The concern that we're dealing with here is a concern about retroactivity, uh, that you heard that mentioned uh, by a couple of the professors. Is it, is it really fair uh, for someone to go before an administrative law judge or another type of adjudicatory panel at an agency and to have his or her case heard and perhaps uh, be the person who gets to have the fun of having a new principle of law or further explanation explained and then be subject to the penalties uh, for that new principle of law. And, and certainly at, at first blush in the enforcement mechanism, it does strike us as unfair. Um, if it wasn't clearly laid out, how is it that we can uh, so quickly hold them accountable for this principle that at the very least hadn't been written down in, in nice form before? And yet, uh, that happens every day uh, in many other areas that we don't consider necessarily to be of grave constitutional concern. Uh, indeed, uh, Judge Katz's colleagues on courts throughout the country, particularly uh, state-level courts, or when he is sitting in diversity jurisdiction, do that all the time in such run-of-the-mill legal matters as tort suits. Uh, you cannot go uh, to the statute books and find out what all of your legal duties are between strangers. Uh, those are elucidated over many years by courts acting in the common law fashion, and there are many people who have had to pay out very large judgments uh, on principles that at the very least uh, had not been laid out quite so clearly before their case reached the court. Um, we do not think of that typically as a travesty or of a constitutional concern. Uh, perhaps it is the case that if it's a judge, it's somewhat different than if it's an agency doing the enforcement. But nonetheless, the retroactivity concern is there. Um, Individual issues uh, do raise issues of unfairness, and there are questions about whether the relief should be prospective or retrospective. But ultimately, what we're all talking about here is transparency and how transparent your government, whether state or federal, although we're talking about the federal government primarily here, should be when it sets out duties that it expects its citizens to follow. Certainly there can be no argument that the notice and comment process through informal rulemaking is designed for that transparency. The agency has to lay its cards on the table and tell you what it wishes to do, the legal principles that allow it to do it, and the policy considerations uh, that it factors most strongly and why it is making its proposal. The public then gets the period to tell the agency why it's right and wrong, or wrong, make suggestions for alternative uh, policy uh, positions, and then the agency has to respond in writing after a respectful period of time to, of consideration of those comments, respond to those comments thoughtfully, and it will have its, its answers challenged in courts throughout the country uh, if people think that the agency has failed uh, to follow the guidelines of the law, interpreted the law improperly, or failed uh, to follow the procedures of the Administrative Procedure Act. But there is, a, there is another way that it is possible to engage in rulemaking that we engage in at the Department of Agriculture that has fallen into disuse, uh, which I would suggest uh, might perhaps meld the best of both worlds here, and that is formal rulemaking. That is rulemaking involving an administrative law judge. That is rulemaking that is done completely in public, where any member of the public uh, may come forward and present their testimony. The government, the agency, comes forward and presents what it believes are the rationales supporting its decision. And then each of those persons who present uh, the uh, testimony is subject to cross-examination from any other participant who wishes to ask them a question or challenge the premises on which they are basing their argument. The ex parte rule applies. That means that everything involved in the proceeding must take place in what amounts to the open hearing presided over by the ALJ. You can't have what you so often do in the informal notice and comment process where people who can't afford very expensive lobbyists come to the department in order to whisper in the ears of the policymakers. 
and they jot a little note uh, and summary of it, but not getting too specific and stick that in the record and say that's good enough. You can't do that. Another federal agency, the ex parte rule is, is so powerful, another federal agency can't even come in and talk to the department about uh, their concerns. They have to do it on the record in front of the public and face cross-examination. There can be nothing more transparent than formal rulemaking. Indeed, Justice Thomas, in some of his recent concurring opinions, thinking about Chevron and its propriety, has noted that if there were a case to be made in Justice Thomas's mind for when an agency should receive deference, it should be when it uses formal rulemaking. He has also suggested and noted quite readily that when the APA was originally passed, uh, they thought that formal rulemaking would be the way that uh, most rules were made. That is not the case at all. It is basically a dead letter outside of the Department of Agriculture and a few specific uh, circumstances in uh, fellow uh, federal agencies. And one reason what I would suggest to you is for all the talk about transparency and due process is because perhaps it is that what we're really after is not too much transparency. You note that I noted that it's very common in the informal rulemaking process for lobbyists and others with interest before the agency to come whisper in policymakers' ears. Uh, I would also point out for all of those who love to talk about notice and comment and how public it is, the strange phenomenon that we in federal agencies see that people who wish to file comments don't file their comments early in the process so that everyone can have a chance to look at them and comment on them. Instead, they wait until, oh, I don't know, about an hour before before the thing closes, uh, and then file them all so that we have to read them, but no one else can carp at what they have said. These private interests and private uh, desires are what cause people to pay excellent attorneys like Ms. Ho to make their case in federal court. Um, those private interests should be kept in mind when you hear people carping about the need for transparency. But I would suggest to you that if transparency is what you're after, and openness is what you want, and you want your rules promulgated in a way where we know what our responsibilities are before we act, then perhaps formal rulemaking is for you. Thank you. So why don't we begin by giving each of our panelists a couple of minutes to respond to anything else they heard that interests them. Wow, I didn't think we'd get, let's, get, let's go back to formal rulemaking, let's get rid of Chenery and Chevron and adjudication. This is great, this is a lot. Um, the one thing I've struggled with in our conversation and just kind of more generally is, I mean, the world of agency adjudication is just so broad and diverse. Uh, and again, I think Justice Gorsuch is struggling with this. Like in, in the one context, do we want like an immigration? Is that the type of world where we think that should all go to an Article Three court or do we want an attorney general to be able to have final policymaking authority? I mean, where I am most concerned in areas that touch on private rights or that where the, where the agency official has the ability to give out civil penalties, uh, but that's a very, 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 very small segment of the agency adjudication landscape. And then the rest of it, where you're dealing with generally public benefits, I think immigration is a harder area, but other ones like social security, I can't imagine we'd want all those to go to Article Three courts, right? I'm just kind of curious for, I mean, obviously Jack doesn't, but I mean, I don't know, Allison, if you have like a, you know, sense of would you, where would you draw the line between your arguments that this is, if not unconstitutional, at least really bad governance uh, and not? I guess that was kind of my question. Yeah, well, I think, you know, and I think you really actually kind of hit the nail on the head when you were talking about um, sort of this whipsaw in terms of, you know, areas where you want political accountability. Um, versus the political, to the extent that political accountability starts to sound like policy making and, and, and partiality. Um, and so I, I think from my perspective, um, and I agree, I agree that I think that the issues really come to a nub with that strata of proceedings that, you know, that like SEC ALJs, right, which was, was what made Lucia such an interesting, such an interesting case. Um, but, but I do think there is this, you know, certainly, and I think we'll, we'll, we can, you know, have meaningful discussions about, 
you know, at what point an adjudication kind of crosses a line, if not an Article Three line, then a good government um, line. Um, but I think from the standpoint of policy making, I think any time you have a, 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 sort of an adjudicator making policy in a process that is deciding rights between individuals. I think that, that raises the concerns, exactly the concerns that the founders had um, when they ensured structural protections. So I, had, I had three, three, quick, uh, three quick points in reaction to some of uh, what was said. The first thing is, I just think it's plain wrong to say that when agencies are doing adjudication, they're subject to Article Three. And the reason I say that is because basically, as Justice Thomas says, they're executing the law, they're using an adjudicatory form. And I'll give you an example that I hope people would agree with. Prosecutors all the time have to make decisions about what crime to charge, and they have to make sometimes broad policy. We're not gonna charge these kind of petty crimes, we're gonna focus our resources on this kind of crime, whatever. Now suppose a prosecutor decides that he's not sure what to charge someone with. So he says to the person, okay, listen, come in and bring your lawyer and I'll have one of my prosecutors in my office and let's argue it out about what, I should, what level I should charge you at. Is that prosecutor suddenly exercising Article III judicial power? It's one of the most important, consequential effects you can have on someone's private interests. It's about liberty and I think that the answer is Obviously, no, they're not exercising Article III power. They've just decided to exercise their executive power using what looks like an adjudicatory form. Now, here's the, the rub is deference. And as my colleagues know, I've written a pa papers about why Chevron is such a terrible doctrine. Uh, not, I haven't really focused that much on this issue, but in my new paper where I talk about Article III adjudication, I say that the Constitution does not allow for deference to the decisions of the prosecutor for reasons I think that Allison said about that you shouldn't be a judge in your own case. But now it's interesting because when the agency is, is adjudicating a case between two private parties, it's actually not a judge in its own case. It's a judge, it's judging uh, two different parties and that's the case where I think there's the most difficulty. The agencies are always judges in their own case when they're doing benefits determinations, for example, and that's where Article Three has no effect at all. That, a, that uh, the Social Security Administration can go ahead and have non-Article Three people holding those hearings because that's a public right that's traditionally been understood to not be uh, subject to, to Article Three. So I think that, um, I think that the, it's, it's, I think Justice Thomas is exactly right on this and that the people that are trying to do something else in terms of expanding this sort of preemptive scope of Article Three, just they don't like the US Constitution, they want some other Constitution. Now the last thing I would say, I just want to uh, respond to the issue of late comments. And I understand that's a problem and the, thing, what I, the agencies are always free of course to reopen the comment period. So if people put in important comments at the last minute, the agencies that are smart about it will then reopen the comment period and allow people to respond to them. And I'm as concerned as anybody about arbitrary agency action, whether it's using a rulemaking form or, or an adjudicatory form, but I think that ultimately Congress is responsible for creating this whole administrative state, and it's been done in a democratic fashion, and so really the complaint about this is not that it's sort of undemocratic or unaccountable, it's that Congress made bad choices, and they seem to be really experts at doing that, regardless of which party has the, uh, the power in Congress. Allison, or anything else? No. Stephen? I think, um, first of all, I'm turn that on. Hello, there we go. First of all, I'm, I, I would like to thank the professor for shouting out our judicial officer at the Department of Agriculture. She will be thrilled that she got a mention here, so I will let her know that when I, when I get back to the department. Um, I think that uh, the task that agencies have before them is, is quite difficult. And uh, the rulemaking process uh, is, is one where uh, it truly is better not to know uh, how it goes on uh, within the agencies. Uh, but public comment does play an important role. And, and one thing that I think is very clear from this administration is um, it is always better, uh, as imperfect as the system is, uh, for agencies uh, to hear from the people whom they are regulating before they go forward. Um, those comments are taken into account. I know there can be skepticism about that. I can't speak for all my federal colleagues, uh, but I can assure you that at the Department of Agriculture, uh, if you submit a comment uh, 
uh, even though we may not agree with you, uh, it does have an effect on what we do and how we think about the issues. Uh, as far as the roles that agencies have, I certainly want to agree with Professor Bierman uh, on one of his main points. Uh, the larger role that agencies have is a creature of congressional decision. And speaking as someone uh, who has to deal with the issues which Congress so frequently punts uh, to the administrative state, uh, I, for one, would like them to decide many more things and leave us with less things to do and fewer decisions to make. Uh, unfortunately, they often find that the easiest thing to do is to identify the problem, identify 10 factors that they would like for someone to consider, and then pass it to someone else for them to make the decision. And at the heart of the debate that we are having here today uh, is the fact that Congress is deciding less and less, and yet there is more and more we want our federal government to do. And someone is expected to pick up the slack. So uh, let me begin with some questions for the panel, and then we'll um, throw it open to you all. So first, um, Chris, you began on, on Lucia. You suggested that there was some important connection between converting the ALJs into officers of the United States and putting them um, on the political side of the line, making them accountable. Um, could you elaborate on that? I mean, it strikes me that I'm not sure why that's right in so far as the appointments clause governs both the, the appointment of the quintessentially political actors like the heads of executive agencies, but it no less governs the appointment of quintessentially independent actors like Article III judges. And isn't it really more important figuring out, if you're figuring out are these people going to be politically responsive or not, really the answer to the removal question, which the court reserved? Yeah, no, I, mean, I, 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 I think it was hard for the, I think it's hard for the administration to figure out what to do now, because really the removal question is the really, the, I think the much more important and going to be the more transformational question. I think on the, the ALJ side, you know, having the head of the department um, be the one that's appointing uh, instead of the Merit Protection Services Board. Um, ultimately, I mean, you've seen how the administration's rolled it out. It, it actually is going to end up, I think, with ALJs that are more expert in the agencies where they work, right? Because now that, that's actually one of the requirements that labor and some of these others where they have it. But I don't, I don't necessarily think, like in the Thomas and Gorsuch line, that it's ultimately going to end up being like the political accountability argument is not going to be as strong as, uh, as I think they probably see it as like an original matter. I do think the agency final policy making role is though, right? I mean, that, that, that for me is really from a constitutional perspective, stepping back from the appointments clause issue and just talking more generally about political accountability, the fact that the agency head has the final say uh, is what makes it an agency adjudication in my mind, uh, and not just, and, and so whether the, the original administrative law judges are appointed or not, as long as the agency head has a final say, uh, I think you kind of resolve some of those issues of accountability that the framers were concerned about with the appointments clause. Any reactions? Okay. Um, Jack, um, we'll stipulate that some people in the room might um, view this as just one of many um, concerns about the administrative state. But let's just for the sake of argument, um, assume that rulemaking is generally fine and you've made a compelling case that adjudication has a lot of upsides to it. Um, but let's just narrowly focus on one situation in which there may be a downside, which, which is Nick Stephen mentioned it. It's, it's the retroactivity and fair notice points. So take the case where an agency has been given the choice to act by rule or by adjudication, and there's a perfectly respectable policy debate that could, they could say X, they could say not X, and it turns out they have said X, and they want to change sides, and they do it in an adjudication and try to make that retroactive. Do you see any sort of, um, to what extent do you see something like that 
as problematic? And if so, is, is it just a policy question for Congress and the agencies to work out? Or are there any judicially enforceable limits on agency's ability to impose that kind of um, uh, uh, liability on folks? Right, so what you haven't, what you, what you didn't mention is what the consequences of to, were to the private party. So if there's a massive Fair enough, fine, so there's severe. a massive fine that's going to be imposed based on something that was announced to have been legal and, and it's going to be retroactively uh, made illegal and then a big fine, I think that it would take about five seconds for a district judge or a, a, or a circuit judge to say that that's arbitrary and capricious. That's not appropriate. And that's, for example, in the, in the Fox television case where Justice Scalia, I think, so smartly explained uh, that the standard of review for changes in policy is virtually the same as the standard of review for imposing an initial policy. In that case, the FCC explicitly said they weren't, gonna, they weren't going to impose any fines at that point. They were just gonna, they were gonna tell the people what you did was wrong, and, you were, and in the future, people would be subject to fines. And I think any sensible agency is gonna do it that way. Now, you have a different situation, for example, something about whether it's an unfair labor practice, for example, and it was clearly allowed, and then the, and then the NLRB says, no longer is this clearly allowed. Uh, it's gonna be either under some circumstances or maybe across the board, it's not gonna be allowed. Now there, what you have is the agency ordering someone to act in a different way than they thought they were allowed to. But it's, it's not gonna be, a, it's not a penalty. And so I think that to, to say that they can never do it retroactively would unduly hamper the agency's ability to adjust its policies. And I should point out, you know, that in the, the federal Congress, Congress passes retroactive laws. And what I mean by retroactive laws is they pass laws, let's say in September, saying if anyone did this as of last April, here are the consequences. And the standard of review for that is minimal scrutiny rational basis. Now, maybe you think that's wrong, uh, but I think that the, um, those are situations in which the legislation can have a much more severe effect than what agencies are likely to be doing in their retroactive decision making. And I'm only talking about cases where there are strong private interests where there's penalties involved. When it comes to benefits and that sort of thing, I think it's even less scrutiny on the agency. So I, I, I would think that I would favor not allowing an agency to put severe penalties on somebody, but in terms of telling them that what you did was, we said it was okay, but actually it's not okay, if it's just a question of ordering them then to make up for something or uh, obey it in the future, like a new kind of bargaining uh, or some other sort of you know, new adjustment to what you can do in your, in your television station, I think that that's fine. I mean, unless you go with Jeremy Bentham and think that ev all retroactive law is wrong, and that, goes, that attacks the common law, which I know is not really on the table. I mean, I guess, I mean, just to respond, I mean, well, one, Congress is elected, right? And so, you know, then they can be unelect, you know, not voted back in. Uh, but even on the agency side, I mean, I think this is the real debate is if it's in a rulemaking or a formal rulemaking, which, by the way, Aaron Nielsen's just loving this right now. He has a great paper on defensive formal rulemaking that you should all read. But, like, you know, at least there the public's getting input. There's notice and the like. In an adjudication, I, 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 it's oftentimes just between that private party and, I don't know, and you'd mentioned before also, oh, well, everyone knows about it. It's like, I did a lot of security known private practice. No one knows about it. You don't tell people as a client, you know, you don't, that's not something you broadcast. You work that out and try to, so I just, it, it is done in a real private setting. I just worry that any type of retroactive application uh, it, it, through adjudication, could have some kind of serious good governance problems and arguably some, at least some constitutional tensions if that's the role that the I, agency's doing. I just don't see it. I don't see yeah. what, the, what are the constitutional tensions. That would make common law unconstitutional. And I think that the, the idea of, first of all, it's not administrative law judges that are making agency policy. They're, got, they're required to follow agency policy. They can't question what the agency tells them. So it's only agency heads. And so those are politically appointed people that are accountable presumably by the fact that they went through a political appointment process. So I just don't, I, I, I mean, and, I, and again, because agencies generally use their discretion to not impose severe penalties when they're doing something new, and where I think if they did that, courts would be there to say that it's arbitrary and capricious to tell someone that they're gonna get a massive fine for something that at the time the agency had already announced was legal. I just don't see it as a serious problem. It's a more theoretical problem, I think, than a real problem. All right, um, Allison, let's talk about another one of your great cases, which is Perez versus Mortgage Bank. Um, so that 
was a case about the line between legislative and interpretive rules. And uh, so my court um, got upset <laughs> at agencies changing their interpretations of regulations and came up with a somewhat creative view that an interpretation, an interpretive rule becomes a legislative rule when the agency is changing an interpretation and you had the um, unenviable task of trying to defend that. Um, we got slapped down pretty hard. Um, but a lot of the opinions in that case said, look, you can't, you can't mess with what the APA says about interpretive versus legislative, but there is an underlying problem. And the underlying problem flows from judicial deference yes. to the agencies. Um, so I wonder um, to what extent you think there might be a similar dynamic going on here, which is we're talking about agency adjudication, but maybe the real problem is that once the agency does the adjudication and then you go on judicial review, you don't get a clean shot at the agency's legal rulings and how much of your concern would be assuaged if, say, we didn't have Chevron or Seminole Rock in a, a particular category of adjudication? You know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a really insightful question and I think part of my concern, to the extent that my concern is about, is structural is kind of baked in to policy making by adjudication, um, it wouldn't. But it certainly would go a long way toward mitigating the problem. Um, if you didn't have a system set up where, uh, you know, you're essentially def judicial deference to the enforcer, um, which is sort of a strange right. thing when you, when you think about it. And, you know, bringing up, uh, mortgage mortgage bankers. I mean, what I thought um, was so interesting about that case, and it, I, I completely agree with you that I think the court perceived that there was this doctrine, um, and it was essentially honored in the breach. I mean, there was this doctrine that had existed for decades that allowed a court um, <laughs> to basically invalidate agency action where it was a rever it's been a reverse course and it was, it was substantially important something and i think in decades it had only been actually applied to invalidate a rule very rarely and i just always thought of it as you know the dc circuit like they're they're the beat cops of the administrative state and the doctrine which is called paralyzed veterans doctrine terrible name um, right. for the doctrine but it's called the paralyzed veterans doctrine i always saw it as you know this was just how the DC Circuit, in a world where they were post hour and it developed not long after right. uh, the hour decision um, came down requiring uh, deference to agency uh, in, uh, uh, interpretations of their own rules, um, as sort of the you know the break the glass, pull the pull the uh, pull the alarm for just the most egregious cases, and I think. What we saw when that case was litigated is the court across the board saying, "Look, the APA doesn't doesn't allow this, but this is an understandable response right. to a serious problem of our deference um, that the court, uh, you know, should should deal with." And I'm I'm hopeful uh, that we will will see action on that front soon. All right, Stephen, one for you, and then we'll um, we'll throw it open for the audience. Um, formal rulemaking. Um, Supreme Court has construed the APA in a way that will almost never compel agencies to do formal rulemaking. So I guess my question is, how, how much of it are you all doing to the extent you know? How, how much is the administration doing more broadly? Um, I didn't really see any when I was in the White House Counsel's Office. and. Um, you know, it's fine in academic forums like this to talk about good government, the good government interests of it, but it would seem like there are pretty huge incentives not to do it if you don't have to do it. Well, I, I think uh, I'll address your question and then I'd like to, if I, with your permission, circle back on some things Ms. Ho said about deference. Sure. Because I think that's 
that's also framing much of the discussion. So with regard to formal rulemaking, the Department of Agriculture engages in it uh, with a, a weird structure that we have on marketing and, and regulatory boards. And these are the boards that exist uh, that basically set standards. Uh, and in certain cases, and statutes dating all the way back to the Great Depression, prices uh, for some of the commodities that you purchase uh, on an everyday basis, things like milk, uh, for example, might be, might be one of the larger ones. And we engage in a formal rulemaking process. As a matter of fact, uh, during, this, during this administration, uh, we finished a marketing order for California. Uh, that hearing went 50 days. Uh, and was held on site in California to allow the California producers to actually be able to attend and, and participate in the hearings. Now, you raise an interesting point about um, how uh, formal rulemaking is uh, not as high profile, and there is an interesting reason for that. So Executive Order 12866 was promulgated by President Clinton, and it sets out much of the current review process by the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and what has to go through the Office of Management and Budget, i.e. the White House, to make certain that the uh, administrative state is, is to the extent that we can, moving in one direction in accord with administration policy. But if you read Executive Order 12866 carefully, uh, you will see that it, it sets out some exceptions for items that don't come under um, uh, its terms and OMB's review. Uh, and one of those items, which was confirmed in a, in a side letter uh, that was issued by President Clinton's uh, OMB director, is formal rulemaking. So if an agency decides to engage in formal rulemaking, OMB is kept at bay. Now, you are correct uh, that most agencies do go uh, almost always to informal rulemaking, but there is nothing to stop an agency from deciding uh, that it would like to engage in a formal rulemaking proceeding. Indeed, um, I think it would be uh, a wonderful practice and, and one that has crossed my mind, which is why I made the uh, comments here today, for an agency that has some experience with formal rulemaking to show that, yes, indeed, it is possible for this methodology to work uh, and to pick a, a rule uh, to go through formal rulemaking. And I think one of the advantages uh, might be uh, if an agency were to go through formal rulemaking is because it is ordered uh, there is a, a judge, an administrative law judge on the dais, uh, who is keeping control and, and making rulings about what's appropriate to hear or not. It does have the advantage of preventing an agency's rulemaking proceeding from being hijacked uh, by interests who uh, may indeed uh, care about the issue at play, but their greatest objection to it has nothing to do uh, with the, what the agency actually has jurisdiction over. Um, that happens quite often uh, in proceedings and, and oftentimes uh, in, in informal rulemaking. Uh, and uh, you get letter writing and other campaigns stirs up members of Congress, and yet it really isn't relevant to the point that the agency has within its jurisdiction. Um, in a formal rulemaking proceeding, all that heat uh, and light would go away because the judge would rule it out of order, and that would be the end of it. Um, I think that's one particular circumstance uh, where if an agency were... Uh, considering formal rulemaking, uh, it might want to go that route. Um, with regard to deference, um, I think it's important to keep in mind uh, both sides of the ledger. There are problems with deference. There are advantages to deference. One of the things that I think it's important for anyone to keep in mind when considering what a rule should be is that the person uh, who is going to be administering this rule uh, is not always going to be someone who thinks like you. And so you should think about, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you set on, um, how do you feel about this particular principle when someone who believes the exact opposite of you is the one pulling the levers? Chevron was a case that came around in the early 1980s. If you think about the world of the early 1980s, you had a brand new president, uh, who was an actor, uh, who had come into office saying that we needed to deregulate. After a decade of onerous regulations being passed by uh, presidents of multiple parties, you had a judiciary that looked very different than our judiciary today in some respects. 
on Judge Katz's court still set Skelly right, and he had a particularly different point of view as to what the province of power of the judiciary is than most of the people who sat in this room. And Judge Wright would be the one who would be determining uh, whether or not the agency's deregulatory actions or change in regulatory posture was appropriate as a matter of first instance uh, with nothing to guide him and no tip of the hand to the agency uh, in a world where Chevron did not exist. Now that, makes some, that may make some people comfortable, that may make others uncomfortable. I think whatever becomes of Chevron and its progeny, one thing that we should try not to do is create a system where whatever the agency puts down the pike the first time it does a rulemaking on a new statute does not become ossified because some court somewhere says that was exactly the right way you should have done it, you followed the statute incredibly well, good job agency, or that was entirely the wrong way to do it, the only possible answer is X and it will be X forevermore unless Congress asks. There is something to be said for administrative flexibility. It allows for elections to have consequences and that is not a bad thing. All right, we are uh, more or less on time, so we have plenty of time for questions. I see there's a mic over there. I, I, like Amy Barrett, I'm having trouble with the lights. There's one over there too, so um, the floor is open. Yes. I haven't got it live yet, thank you. Uh, Brooks Harlow, I'm a co communications attorney in the area. Um, uh, do any of you have any kind of predictions or expectations with the shifting makeup of the Supreme Court, whether it's possible they're going to reach out and take a fresh look at Chevron deference? And a follow-up question, just assuming they do, just for fun, which agency would you like to see that review come out of? <laughs> you know, it's, it, there's sort of a joke about Chevron. You know, and Justice Gorsuch and the Tenth Circuit, you know, was the, it probably has the most explicit rejection of Chevron deference. And of course, the Chevron case itself, they were deferring to his mother. So there's always this like, you know, maybe there's some fi family dynamic going on there. But that's a, a, just a silly, inappropriate comment. But, um, you know, I, I actually, I, 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 um, I agree that Chevron is open for re-examination. I don't think they're going to ever have an opinion, at least not very soon, where they say, oops, we were wrong in Chevron. What we've seen is a narrowing of Chevron, and the, especially with the Chief Justice's um, opinion in the, uh, in the Affordable Care Act case, where he reinvigorated the major questions exception to Chevron to be what the court had previously rejected, which is any sort of big rule with major economic consequences is no longer going to get Chevron deference. I think that it makes a, takes, you know, is a major hit on Chevron. And I think that um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I would really respect the, this, the administration if the administration itself went into court saying you should overrule Chevron or get rid of Chevron, because that would be arguing against their own interests in terms of winning the particular case. My prediction is they're not going to do that, but I would, be, I would really respect that. And I think that to answer um, the issue about, about flexibility, um, and I'm not going to I won't give you the citation, but in my paper where I say get rid of Chevron, I also say that the replacement of Chevron ought to be something where the court uses the factors that were announced in the Skidmore case to determine how much deference to give to an agency decision, and that it's consistent with the principles underlying that, that an agency can subsequently change its mind and still be subject to that sort of deference. And it has to do with a slightly repositioned a theoretical basis for Chevron, which is I don't think it's correct to say that every time that Congress does something that's ambu ambiguous, it means to give this strong form of discretion to the agencies. I do think, though, that very often Congress has prescribed a range within which the agency action is appropriate. And in a case like that, the fact that the agency under one administration decides it one way, that as long as the subsequent administration uh, is within that range, that it would be appropriate to defer to that decision also, even under the original Skidmore factor. So I disagree with Justice Scalia when he says that if you apply Skidmore, you're ossifying the law, you're, you're saying it's this for all time. Okay. Uh, yes. Kurt Levy. Um, 
if I've understood this debate correctly, uh, the people who, who object to the, the status quo are, are objecting to, to two things. One, just agencies adjudicating cases, you know, adjudicating their own rules, even if it doesn't affect other parties outside of, outside of the, the case. Um, and the other is using adjudication to do policy making. The first, I'm, I'm assuming, isn't gonna change much anytime soon. The second strikes me as something where there could be maybe some reform or incremental change. And so, you know, my question is, what could the change be? I mean, I guess it could come from the White House. It's, uh, certainly the White House can make, could make changes with regard to rulemaking a little harder with regard to adjudication, certainly the court could say something, Congress could do something, you know, maybe an adjudication version of the RAINS Act. I mean, it's harder than the RAINS Act because it's, you know, there's a thin line between, again, adjudicating a particular case and, and policy making. But in any case, do you have any reforms in mind? So I, I think, I mean, again, for me, it's, we're kind of conflating adjudication generally with adjudication of like private rights or quasi-private, you know, I think in the, in the smaller subset of cases, if you read Chief Justice Roberts's you know, opinion in Stern v. Marshall, he lays out a, a roadmap for getting rid of adjudication of private rights entirely. Uh, and that could have some pretty dramatic effects uh, to how that goes. And he justifies Crowell v. Benson, which is like the classic private rights adjudication case from the 30s on the ground that you're a true adjunct and what I was trying to tease out in my last like 45 seconds of my opening was, if we're gonna try to play around with what a true adjunct is, uh, and we don't really have a great um, intellectual foundation for what that means, the courts haven't really spent too much time talking about that. One thing that it could mean though is that in those contexts, there's no policy making authority in the context of private rights. I think that's probably a pretty reasonable interpretation of what a true adjunct to an Article III court is uh, and so I do think like those are moves that the court could make on its own as it grapples with adjudication of private rights when that comes up. Uh, otherwise, I think you're left with Congress or the president, uh, with the president's one just being voluntary and, you know, Congress, the chance that they'd pass agency adjudication reform anytime soon is probably really low, so. Okay. I, I, I would just say that um, one thing that the uh, administration can do and is doing is uh, forcing agencies to think about these questions in the interagency process as they go about making policy decisions. Um, these are questions that when you talk to our wonderful career employees in the federal government have not frequently been asked before by administrations of both political parties. Uh, in other words, really questioning, uh, isn't this something that should go through rulemaking? Isn't this something that should go through notice and comment? Why do you want to just publish something in the Federal Register and think that everyone's going to read that or go to your website and think that they're going to be able to find the page on your website where this magical list, uh, which will tell you what's in and what's out, is posted? Um, these are discussions that are happening. Uh, it's not always evident to uh, those who are not uh, within the administration. Uh, but here I will give credit to the Office of Management and Budget, and there will be people at my department who want to club me over the head for saying this. But, um, but I, I do think that they do a very good job from a legal policy standpoint of forcing agencies to confront that the easiest thing for the agency to do is not always the best thing for the agency to do when it comes to providing notice and providing public input. And rulemaking truly is favored uh, in this administration for making any type of policy determination and requiring notice and comment beforehand is a must. And so I have to tip my hat uh, to Ms. Rao and her colleagues uh, at OIRA for seeing to it that that really has had some bite. Okay. Can I make one more quick point on sure. this? I think one thing we saw at the end of the Obama administration and that we've seen a lot in the Trump administration is actually not making policy and instead saying that the law controls. I think that's one interesting kind of dynamic. I mean, you think through uh, a lot of the Trump administration's deregulatory or kind of rollbacks has been, we can't do anything here. What the Obama administration did was, did was not lawful. We have, you know, and similarly in the Obama administration, we have to do this. This is the only interpretation of the statute. I um, mean, they're still making policy, but they're doing it in a way that gets around Chevron. And I think that's kind of another kind of fascinating development if we're gonna see this more uh, 
Uh, obviously, it has great benefits because if the Supreme Court says that the Affordable Care Act means X, it's going to mean X forever, whereas if, opposed if they say Chevron deference, a new administration can reverse field, right? But I do think that's an interesting feature you've seen, I think, amped up even more in the Trump administration, is the answer isn't this is a better policy. It's we can't do what the prior administration did. Uh, I think that's an interesting development if we're going to see more of that go along those lines. Can I just say one thing about that? That's, that's a relatively high stakes um, strategy. I, I published a, a short piece where I said that if the courts disagree with them on their view of what the Clean Air Act means, for example, then they lose their repeal of the Clean Power Plan. But they did it that way, I assume, to avoid having to go through years of research to show that all the research that the Obama administration had done was wrong. OK, next question. Hi, uh, Devin Watkins. Um, Excluding for a moment the Social Security Administration and adjudications like that, uh, imagine if we just replaced the ALJs with federal magistrates selected by Article III judges. Uh, and then you can still appeal to the head of the agency, and then policy making, if they have to do it through adjudication, will be clearly done by the head of the department then. And when they appeal then to the judiciary, the difference, if they disagree with facts or something, may not be given the deference that is given right now, where the magistrate and the head of the agency disagreed as to what the factual situation would be. In a situation like that, do you think that would solve your problems with the current um, uh, adjudication system? Well, I think it would certainly go a long way toward doing that, and I think you highlight a point that the professor was making and that uh, the Chief Justice made in, um, in the Stern case, which is about sort of Article III supervision. In other words, if you have these agency proceedings and they're true adjuncts, like in bankruptcy say, they're true adjuncts of the federal district court and you have meaningful Article III supervision, then I do think that goes a long way toward addressing some of the structural concerns um, that we've talked about today that, that, that are currently sort of baked into the system. I'm, I'm a little unclear. They would be appointed by the courts, which is yes. under the appointments clause, if they're inferior officers, then the appointments clause says that they can be appointed by a court of law. And there's some disagreement um, about whether that would apply to administrative law judges. Basically, you're just renaming the administrative law judges magistrate judges, I suppose. I'm trying, what, are you talking about further supervision than just the fact that the court, that the, their decisions are appealable to court the way they are now by administrative law judges? Well, I would assume that they would get appointed by a court of law and not the agency themselves. Right. And that, that court of law would then oversee those magistrate judges if they are not following the law in some way and can remove them and replace them if necessary. Right. You know, I'm, I'm actually, I've come out in favor of, of uh, having courts of law appoint administrative law judges. It doesn't matter to me what you name them, but I think it makes sense because I'm a little concerned and I don't want to, I can't prejudge this because I'm actually doing an administrative conference report on this issue um, with Jen Mascot together, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that uh, under the um, other possible uh, processes to replace the current way they're appointed, that it would become too political and we would have, they'd be less trustworthy and less, uh, and they'd be more prone to bias. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, if you need more context, I can provide it. But uh, my question is in say like the National Labor Relations Board announces rules and adjudication. Are those considered final agency action under the Administrative Procedure Act that can be challenged? I mean, generally, uh, rulemaking is final agency action, and then you have to meet the Abbott Labs fitness and hardship test to get immediate judicial review, uh, as opposed to waiting, uh, postponing it. And there are plenty of situations where you would postpone it when you weren't exactly sure how the agency was going to apply it. Uh, but the, um, it's a ripeness, it's a, the, the court in the Abbott Labs case said that it was final for the purpose of the APA, but that there was a separate ripeness inquiry, which is whether it's, um, there's fitness you know, it's a purely legal issue versus factual issues involved, and whether it's there's hardship in postponing review to an adjudicate to a future adjudication. Right, but that would apply to rules in a, that are made in adjudication as well as rulemakings. Oh no, no, no! If the, if the agency issues an order against someone at the end of an adjudication, that's going to always be immediately reviewable. Always. Well, uh, under Section Nine of the National Labor Relations Act, uh, those cases aren't always reviewable. They're committed to agency discretion, so. Say the NLRB comes up with 
a rule that's just completely outside of the statute. I mean, you could try and bring a case in court under Leadem, but that's tough. So they announce a rule, they apply it to your case, you have no judicial review, except in Leadem. Could you challenge the rule itself as a final agency action? This is why I always say I don't know when people ask about the NRB, because it's a weird agency with a very, very strange organic statute compared to most agencies. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert by any means, but we review NLRB orders all the time. Yeah. I mean, at the, if they issue, at the end of this process, have they issued an order that applies to someone telling them to do something or stop yeah, doing something? Yeah, in 1940, the Supreme Court said that those, those cases aren't reviewable by district courts. And if you're an employee, I mean, they said that your avenue is through unfair pr labor practice under Section 10. But if you're an employee that's filed a decertification petition, you can't do that. You have no review under Section 10. Not review. So you're just stuck. Not so I'm just wondering if there's a way to challenge the rule as it being final agency action. I mean, I, I, I think they just come into the D.C. Circuit from agency orders. They, they don't have to go to district court to be reviewable. Not under Section 9. But okay. it, it's a little bit of a complicated question. <laughs> I was trying to make it easy. Just if, if an agency announces a rule in adjudication, would that be considered final agency action under the APA? I mean, an, they, they have made a rule. If they issue an order to someone, which normally happens at the end of an adjudication, that's the process for issuing an order, then that order would be subject to judicial review. Either the party could challenge it, or if the agency tries to enforce it, they could defend based on the invalidity of the legal principle that it was based upon. I mean, there are some weird situations where, where they deny a petition to do something that's committed to agency discretion by law. I understand that, but that, that infects both rulemaking and adjudication. If, they, if, the, if somebody petitions an agency to do something which is committed to agency discretion by law, it doesn't really matter wh what process they used. It's just not reviewable. Okay. Anybody else? Maybe may time for one more. Uh, if not, please join me in thanking our panelists for... <laughs>